All right. There we go. Okay. Okay, again, today I am really, really pleased to introduce Columbus, Ohio based mystery author and Associated Press reporter, Andrew Welsh Huggins. Andrew writes a mystery series set in Columbus featuring Andy Hayes, a former Ohio State University and Cleveland Browns quarterback turned PI. In addition to writing news and novels, Andrew also writes short fiction, which has appeared in numerous publications such as Ellery Queen Magazine and Mystery Weekly. And he has a nonfiction book called No Winners Here Tonight, which is considered the definitive history of the death penalty in Ohio. Andrew has not always lived in Ohio. He grew up south of Rochester, New York, and he has deep Indiana roots. Not only did he spend seven years in Bloomington, but both of his parents grew up in Terre Haute and attended Indiana State University. So I think that kind of makes him a fellow Hoosier. Um, Andrew's program today is titled, Is There a Draft in Here? And uh, will be about the art of revision in three or maybe seven or maybe 11 easy steps. So now I will turn things over to Andrew who surprisingly is not coming to us today from Columbus, but rather Chicago. So take it away, Andrew. Thanks, Janice. Hey, everybody. Um, so good to be with you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, as Janice said, it's, you know, it's an honor anytime, but especially with my Indiana connections, um, I, I do feel like an honorary Hoosier. Uh, all, all our children were born in, um, uh, in Indiana. And in fact, our, um, our oldest daughter was born, I think it's still called Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. So lots of fond memories there. Um, I, I am not actually coming to you from my secret underground bunker. As Janice said, I'm, I'm, we snuck away to Chicago for a little uh, birthday celebration weekend. Um, so this event uh, may include some authentic uh, Chicago police sirens, which I've been hearing. Um, so I think that's perfect for a crime fiction discussion. So uh, I thought what I'm gonna do is, uh, let me tell you just a little bit about myself and how I um, uh, got into mystery writing. And then I'm gonna go over um, essentially my revision practices. Um, I have a slightly unorthodox way that I revise my stories and novels, uh, but it works for me. And I'm hoping you can all take a little bit something away from that. Uh, and then I'm gonna actually go over an actual, a, a short story that I recently had accepted. I'm gonna uh, actually walk us through the revision process and the um, submission process for that, because I think that it's also um, illustrative of, of the challenges that we face when we revise stories. So um, yeah, as <clears throat> Janice said, I, I refer to myself as a proud native adopted Ohioan. Uh, but I did grow up um, in the Finger Lakes, uh, south of Rochester, in a little town, and was fortunate to, um, probably like a lot of people on this, um, on this call, grew up in a house of uh, readers. Both my parents were uh, huge readers and really grateful for that to this day. My mom uh, was big on mysteries, uh, as well as uh, biographies, and my dad was uh, uh, big on um, sort of thrillers and also um, kind of sprawling historical fiction. So I, I came by my love of reading, honestly. Um, I always like to mention there were three different uh, series that I read as a kid that kind of uh, uh, hooked me for life. One, everybody's probably heard of uh, the Encyclopedia Brown, which I read as a kid. Um, I recently reread the best of Encyclopedia Brown's cases and was very proud of the fact that I got them all right. I solved them all, although it actually took me quite a few rereadings on a couple of the stories. Uh, the second series that you know, some of you may have heard of uh, was called The Happy Hollisters. And this was a series pub, uh, produced by the Stratemeyer Syndicate, which also did um, Nancy Drew. Uh, but it, interestingly, it was written by just one uh, person, Andrew Svensson. Um, published largely during the 60s, although they're back in print now, I'm happy to say. And this was about a, a family of um, five kids um, and their parents, a dog and a cat, and they solve adventures in around a kind of fictional um, lake uh, 
town, probably in New Jersey, if you had to put a, a location on it. Um, and then the uh, the last series I read as a kid, uh, which you may laugh at, is I, I was a huge reader, read everything. My mom called me a back of the cereal box reader. And one day when I was about eight, I um, pulled down one of her Earl Stanley Gardner Perry Mason books and started reading that. Uh, now, that's a little bit strange for an eight year old to read, but um, if you've read any of those books or reread them, um, you'll see pretty quickly um, they're pretty tame. Um, probably the most lurid thing about them is the wonderful um, covers on their paperbacks, things like uh, the case of the velvety claw or the case of the vagabond virgin, none of which probably meant anything to me. But reading those at the time kind of um, it really I really liked being drawn into those mysteries and that really kind of got me going. So um, kind of fast forwarding, you know, I, I continue to read. Uh, and uh, all through high school, college, uh, put my hand to some fictional stories. Uh, I've got at least one uh, novel sitting in the bottom of a desk drawer that um, thankfully will never see the light of day. But like everyone, you know, tried to turn my, my love of reading into writing. Um, I, um, we moved around a lot. Um, my, my wife, Pam, and I have uh, been together um, actually, we're celebrating 40 years of being together this this month, and we've uh, moved all over the place. So we lived in a number of places, including uh, we went to college in Ohio. Uh, we lived in um, South Dakota for a while. We lived in um, Providence, Rhode Island. We lived in Bloomington. Uh, it was Providence where I got my start as a journalist. Um, I was a freelance writer in Providence in the 1980s, and that was a time when, of course, this is just really the internet was, was not even a thing yet, but um, there were still a number of print publications and it was possible to make a little bit of money as a freelance writer. And then as Janice um, alluded to, we moved to Bloomington in 1989. Uh, my, I followed my wife there uh, where she was doing graduate work at IU. And uh, this was a really fortuitous move because I went to work for the uh, paper in Bloomington, the, um, the Herald Times. And I spent seven years there and really really cut my teeth as a, as a young journalist. And um, like almost every uh, new reporter, I was assigned the uh, police beat when I got there. Now, this has always struck me as a little bit um, odd that they, they give junior reporters the police beat. Because if you think about it, the police beat involves some of the most sensitive um, uh, topics that are going to appear in a newspaper because you're often talking about uh, pretty horrible crimes and, and things that have really shaken a community. But for better or for worse, um, they put me there and I did that for three years and, and really, um, I really took to it. And I'm not sure to this day exactly why um, I, you know, I did not grow up um, in some kind of gritty living situation. Um, I can't remember which writer said it, but, you know, I had the kind of, uh, I had the kind of happy childhood that is so harmful to writers, but uh, I took to being a police reporter. And I think the combination of that experience and continuing to read mysteries and also starting to write mysteries uh, on my own um, really um, inspired me. So I had been writing, I wrote a lot of short stories uh, when we lived in Bloomington, uh, private eye stories, that's always been uh, a love of mine. None of them have ever been published. Um, I don't think I quite had the um, system for attacking publication that I have now, but also I just don't think I was ready yet. We moved, um, we eventually left uh, Bloomington and we moved back to Ohio. My wife is from Cleveland. Um, I worked uh, for a short period of time at the Youngstown Vindicator. Um, Youngstown, if you don't know that city, is a former uh, steel town uh, in eastern, sort of northeastern Ohio. The Vindicator uh, was uh, one of the country's last privately owned big papers, and um, it was a really great place to work. Fantastic news town. Pretty, Youngstown was a pretty gritty place in the mid-1990s, but I, I learned a lot. Um, Unfortunately, the Vindicator uh, shut down for good in 2019, which was a, a huge blow to the community up there and a great loss to journalism. So I'm really fortunate I got to work there. 
Um, so I came to, uh, I joined the Associated Press in 1998 and moved to Columbus where we've been ever since. And uh, the way I got into uh, book publishing was um, the, uh, starting in the early 2000s, I undertook a pretty big project writing about the death penalty in Ohio. Ohio's death penalty at that point was about two decades old. Uh, nobody had ever really taken a look at um, whether it was working the way it was supposed to. So um, I undertook that project. Uh, I published this big series of stories in 2005 and eventually turned those into a book, um, expanded on my findings and also did kind of a deep dive into the history of the death penalty, both nationally, but also in Ohio. And that book, No Winners Here Tonight, came out in uh, 2009. And I published that with Ohio University Press. Um, I did another nonfiction title for them two years later called Hatred at Home, which is a book about a, a domestic terrorism prosecution in, in uh, Ohio in the early 2000s. Um, but after that, I was really feeling that itch to get into mystery writing. And uh, fortunately, uh, they were at the time looking for a mystery series. And so I pitched this uh, series about a, uh, a private eye based in Columbus. And uh, his backstory, um, uh, you know, you know, these private eyes are always something in their background. There's some kind of fallen angel or wounded warrior. And um, because I'm not from Columbus, um, I was able to have kind of an outsider's view and it didn't take me very long to see the outsized role that Ohio State football played on the consciousness, not just of Columbus, but of the state. So that's why my character is a, a former uh, Ohio State quarterback. Basically, he's a former star player who uh, sort of blows it all and um, quickly becomes, he, he helps the team lose the national championship and becomes quickly becomes the most reviled person in the state, at least fictionally. Uh, so uh, that series has progressed over the years. Um, I published my seventh title um, called An Empty Grave this year. And I've also written several, uh, written and published several short stories featuring the same character. So that's, uh, that's sort of a brief overview of how I got into mystery writing. Unlike a lot of people, it, uh, just because of the sort of strange path that I took, Actually, um, I, I went kind of backwards. I was able to publish some books first and then started publishing short stories. And um, there's kind of a um, synergy there for me. I really enjoy writing short stories uh, because of the discipline of writing a story. It's often a nice break from working on a big project. Uh, and it's also introduced me to a really wonderful world of um, writers all over the place. So um, let me talk a little bit about, uh, let me take you through a revision process uh, for me. And um, uh, like I said, this is, I, I have a slightly unorthodox uh, method, um, but it works for me. And one point that I'm hoping to, um, uh, that everybody takes, takes away from this, this talk is uh, I'm, I'm big on systems. My wife is always teasing about this. I have a system for everything from unloading the dishwasher to, you know, mowing the lawn. And that comes into my writing as well. But the most important thing is that I think that you find a system that works for you. Um, I'm hoping that you can take a little bit away from my system, but don't treat mine as gospel. The, the whole point is that you, that we find things that allow us uh, to write uh, our fiction and that work for us. So um, this, what I'm going to talk about applies both to my novels and my short stories. Uh, and basically, you know, it, it sort of goes uh, like this. So obviously, the first step is conception. What's the idea going to be? And uh, oftentimes with short stories, I will have um, sort of plots will just come to me, this happened to me recently, where just I was staring at a sign or something, and an entire story just popped into my mind for some reason. So uh, I, in both, in both novels and short stories, I generally have a good idea of where things are going, um, but I try to remember to leave room for adventures um, on, the, on the journey, on the way to the destination, so I don't have um, 
I don't have a real clear idea of what's going to happen along the way, but I do often know how it's going to end. Uh, in the great plotter versus pantser debate, um, for years I thought I was a pantser because I don't, I really don't outline at all. But more recently, I've decided that I'm I'm more of a plotter. I just plot in my head. Um, I I personally find that if I outline on paper more than a paragraph or two, the whole thing just kind of goes dead for me. So what I have um, what I have devised over the years is a um, a kind of con uh, concurrent process, which I'm going to talk about here uh, in, in a second. So we've got the conception. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention real quickly, because this is actually a, a frequent topic of conversation, is titles. Um, I I found out recently in an online discussion that I'm also I'm kind of on that I'm an outlier on this. I um, I always will title a work as I start it, but I would say no more than fifty percent of the time is that title the the title that I end up with. Um, Sometimes a title will come to me and I'll just realize, oh, that's perfect. That's exactly what this is going to be. But other times, um, I mean, I've even titled some of my, my books, um, you know, number eight or whatever. Um, so I, when we're done, I'd be curious how other people deal with uh, titling. Um, but I do give it a title. And here's where um, my own process starts to kick in. So once I start writing a piece of fiction, I create two documents. The first one is the, uh, the beginning of the work in progress, and that always gets a title and then the date that I start writing. So if I were to start writing a piece of fiction today, uh, I'll call it um, Chicago Mystery dash October 23rd, 2021. And then I create a second document, which I call, uh, uh, it'll have the same title, and then I'll call that Mile Markers. Uh, that probably comes from my um, days as a long distance runner. And that is the closest outcome to outlining uh, that mile markers document, you can call it whatever you want, it's basically just a notes file. That's where I, uh, as, as I'm writing, I will keep track of characters. Um, I will note things that have happened. And as I begin to edit, and as I read through, if I'm deep into a piece of fiction and I realize that something needs to change, I actually won't go back and change it. I will note it in this, this document to at some point go back and, and change. I call this process, um, again, my own word for it, I call it sidelining. So not outlining, but sidelining. So I'm sort of keeping track of things as I go on the side. Now, in terms of a draft, um, I'm, I'm big on trying to uh, do sort of a rocket draft or what sometimes is disgustingly called a vomit draft. Uh, and basically that's a, a short way of saying, I like to try to write an initial draft, um, you know, as quickly as possible given time constraints, all that. And I, I, pref I always prefer going straight through. Um, my process is essentially to uh, write during the given amount of time I have on a day. The next day when I get up and I go back to it, I will edit what I wrote the day before, edit meaning I'll sort of read through it, uh, but then I'll go on. I, I'm not a person who goes, I'm not a person who polishes line by line as I go. I, I much prefer finishing a first draft because that's when, for me, the fun starts. I have something that I can work with. So um, I, let's say I have finished um, Chicago Mystery Dash October 23rd, 2021. Here's where it gets a little unorthodox for me. The next time I go to edit that, that's now a completed work. So when I go in to essentially edit a second draft, I will then date it. I will create a new copy with the date that I've gone back in to edit it. So let's say I've I've written this story and I am, I'm going to go back into it in a few days when it's completed. That will become Chicago Mystery dash, let's say, October 28th, 2021. And this will continue for several drafts. 
Now, obviously the way this is different is um, in the past, uh, it was pretty common for me just to edit the same uh, document over and over again. And that completely works for some people. What I like about my system is essentially, it, it basically gives me confidence in that I can see my progress literally uh, in the number of drafts that I've gone through and I can achieve a kind of comfort level that I've really put the work in. Obviously, I can also see, if I wanted to, the ways things have changed. And this also avoids that problem that I sometimes ran into where I might have been doing a draft and instead of like cutting out seven paragraphs um, and never seeing them again, this way they're preserved. If I had to go back and maybe retrieve them, I'll be honest, I don't go back and do that very often. Um, so in some ways, my process is a little redundant. Uh, but again, I like the fact that it gives me this confidence um, that I can look and see in my, uh, my files. Like, wow, I, this is my sixth revision of this story. I'm starting to feel pretty good about it. So once I... Um, once I get this to the point, once I get a, a story or a novel to the point where I'm starting to feel pretty good about it, and I feel like I've done as much as I can um, in terms of the initial revision, then I do uh, what I call my eyes down edit. And um, this, I, this is really important, no matter how you do it. Essentially what this means is I step away from the computer what I do is I will then send the document to my Kindle app and I will go into the living room, sit in a chair and read the thing just like you would read a book. And this is why I call it eyes down because you don't, you don't have that um, straight on computer gaze anymore. You're actually reading your document as though you would read a book. Now, as everyone knows, you cannot edit on a Kindle, but what I like about the Kindle is you actually can make notes. So what I'll do is as I'm reading through a story, um, nine times out of 10 as I'm doing this and I'm, I'm away from the computer and I'm looking at it, again, just like I would be reading a book, I've, I often find uh, mistakes or things I wanna change. Now, obviously the, correlate, the correlative to this is simply to print your story out and uh, read it on paper, which is another practice that I strongly recommend uh, that you do. So again, you're away from the uh, computer and you've got it in your hand. Uh, the key, as I like to say, is your eyes are down. You're, you're treating it as an actual uh, book or document and not as something blinking in the screen in front of you. Once I do that, I will then go back to the computer, create a, yet another uh, draft and um, make the changes that I've um, uncovered during that, for me, Kindle edit. That's the point where, for me, it goes to my first reader, who um, is my wife, Pam. And uh, she uh, is a, a great reader, great editor, and she will almost always make really good suggestions, things that can make or break a story or book, in, in my opinion. Um, I will then take her suggestions and uh, create yet another draft incorporate those. I might rest a little bit, go back into it maybe one more time. And um, that's when it's probably ready for me to start thinking about submission. And um, here comes the last and most important thing to remind people to do, which I'm always astonished that I don't see this sometimes in some of the best magazines around there, but time to spell check your work. Uh, I use Microsoft Word, uh, which has a super powerful um, spell check function now, you know, as you as you work, so it'll catch mistakes right away, but it doesn't catch everything. And I can't emphasize enough the uh, power of spell checking your right before submission draft, not just to catch spelling errors, but also to um, uh, sometimes when you spell check, it'll just uh, land on words that will remind you like, oh, hmm, something needs to be changed there. Or um, those dreaded repetitive words that we're always trying to uh, avoid. So 
uh, things like, wow, I've said people have shrugged 12 times. I need to deal with that. Or I've said someone started to walk instead of just walked four times. So the spell check can help me in numerous ways. And I, I really um, encourage that as a, uh, as a method for um, your sort of last revision before you think about um, uh, submitting it. So I wanna go over a, um, very quickly, um, I wanna go over a, an actual process of how this worked for me recently uh, for a short story that I just had accepted actually about a week ago. And this is, a, to me, this is a great illustration of um, kind of the, the practice of sticking to it uh, because this, this took me a while. So um, this is a story uh, that is, um, it's got the somewhat unwieldy title of uh, The Legend of Yag Grillhoff. And this is, um, Yag Grillhoff is a uh, fictional book by the writer H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, I, uh, this story was inspired by, um, we had actually visited uh, friends in Providence um, in 2019 or so, uh, or actually, two, uh, sorry, 2018. And we had visited uh, something called the Providence Athenaeum. And that is, um, I was not actually aware of this in until this visit, but this is a private library. And there are probably less than two dozen of these now around the country, but it's kind of a fascinating thing. These are, these are basically membership-based libraries. Uh, they're private, they have a, they have a board. Um, anybody can go in there, but to check books out and stuff, you have to be a member. And what's interesting about them is that they, um, they resemble a lot more like what we stereotypically think of as an old library. Like it's basically all books. Um, and you don't have a lot, you know, you don't have tons of computers and public spaces. Um, now these are things which I think actually make public libraries pretty cool now, but um, you, you know, maybe you're aware of these private libraries, but you should check one out um, if, you, uh, if you haven't seen them. It's a pretty interesting concept. So this was called the Providence Athenaeum. And I, uh, I, I changed the name of that in my story to the Providence Mercantile Library. Um, essentially, it's a story about a um, fictional uh, book by the writer H.P. Lovecraft, who uh, wrote in Providence. And this this book has has been discovered and is worth a great deal of money, and is 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 on display at, at this particular library. So um, I started. I wrote. I started writing the first draft of this story on March nineteenth of uh, twenty nineteen, and the title at that time was called "Don't Judge a Book." So going back over my files, I, uh, I must have finished it in, um, oh, probably 10 days or so. I started a new a draft, or I wrote, I wrote a new draft on April 7th, uh, another one on April 8th. And at that point, I changed the title from Don't Judge a Book to The Legend of Yag Grillhoff. And I did another, so basically I did three revisions in three days. I did another one on, on April 9th. Um, I took about six weeks off. I did a revision on May 20th of 2019, uh, another one in mid-June, and then uh, two more revisions in July. And in between those revisions, I think I was probably working on um, other stories, edits on an upcoming book, that kind of thing. I do like to leave time between drafts of anything just because it always helps. I think if you kind of let the flames die down a little bit, you can go back to it with um, a slightly steadier eye. So um, on um, July 13th of 2019, uh, after uh, I had revised this eight times, so my eighth draft of this particular story, I submitted to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. Uh, now, I'm happy to talk in a little bit more about the whole process of submitting to magazines, but Elf, as some of, as a lot of you, I'm sure you know, Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine is, um, you know, one of the premier magazines, and it also is uh, infamous for the amount of time it takes to get back to you. 
So I submitted that on July 13th of 2019, and 11 months later, on June 10th of 2020, I received a rejection, uh, although with, a, with an encouraging note. So my practice in a situation like that, I mean, 11 months had passed since I'd set eyes on this story. So I did, an, I did another revision after I got that rejection. And so basically the ninth draft at that point, I submitted to um, Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine uh, in late June of 2020. Uh, I uh, received a rejection from them on uh, September 4th. So they have, a, they have a faster turnaround. At that point, I had decided, okay, I feel like I've, resi I've, I've revised this story enough. Um, I submitted it to Mystery Weekly on September 13th of 2020. I uh, got a rejection about a month later. I submitted it, um, I waited um, several months and I submitted it to, um, if some of you are aware of the L. Blanchard contest, which is a short story contest uh, produced by the Crime Bake um, Convention, which is held in uh, Boston in November of each year. And they, they award a, a prize for the best short story. I submitted to that in mid-February of 2021. Um, I eventually found out I, I was not accepted or it didn't go anywhere in early August of this year. At that point, I, um, enough time had passed. I said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna do one more revision. And I had also learned of another um, short story opportunity. So on August 22nd of this year, I did another revision. So if we're counting here, I've now, this is now the 10th a draft of this story. Um, I submitted it to uh, Black Cat Mystery Magazine, which is a, uh, a relatively new magazine that's come up. Uh, I submitted that on September 1st. Um, I was notified early on that it had been held for a second reading, and then it was accepted for publication on October 18th. So that is um, a almost two and a half year journey for that particular story. And I am going to, um, uh, let's see, drop the, uh, there's the uh, Black Cat Mystery Magazine, so you have that. So um, all that I think, I hope is a way of, of uh, emphasizing sort of three, three main things when it comes to revision. Um, and that's first of all, kind of an obvious point, in our writing, we should always play the long game. Uh, we, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of days, weeks, and sometimes not even months. This is an example of this took me two and a half years to get this story published. Uh, the second thing is um, I always like to remind myself and others, try to treat a rejection not as a setback, but as an opportunity. Yeah, I'm always disappointed when I see that email rejecting something of mine. But then I always actually remind myself and I get a little excited, like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to either make this story better and or to find, a, find another outlet and try. Um, and the third thing sort of related to these is, you know, revision, um, it's more of a journey uh, or it, it is a journey. And sometimes that journey is just as important as the destination. Um, Revision is something that I think um, we should always take our time with. And whenever you can give yourself extra time for revision, I think that's always better. Especially if you can, if you feel like you've got your story to the point where it's perfect, uh, at least for me, that's always the time for me to say, okay, this story is fantastic, but I'm gonna put it aside for a month now and not even think about it and come back to it and then see how it looks. And I always, I always find that having the discipline and the patience to uh, wait just a little bit longer uh, to uh, give the story one final read almost always pays off. Anyway, that's, um, that's my story of revision. I think I'm gonna pause now and um, be happy to take any questions um, I've got a few more things I could talk about, but I'll, definitely happy to take questions. I did see there was one question in uh, the chat um, about where I attended, and I went to, uh, my wife and I both attended Kenyon College, which is in um, uh, 
uh, Knox County in Ohio. Anyway, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Janice, I don't know how you want to handle questions, whether in the chat or um, uh, people unmuting, but I'll turn it back to you. Oh, okay. Well, does anybody have questions? Now's the time. Go ahead and um, unmute if you need to. And you can also turn on your video if you're asking a question, that's fine. Oh, okay. Um, Andrew, this is Michael Daphne in Indianapolis. Well, obviously in Indianapolis. Um, I was I was rather interested in uh, about titles because I worked for um, I worked for both UPI and AP, uh, but I spent the most amount of time at UPI. It was so strange because I to this day I can't write anything until I do several things in order: first the title and then my name, and everything else comes after that. <laughs> And so if I'm if I'm stuck on a title, I can't write anything. Even if it's a bad title, if it's, you know, I, I never really, really start with something that's just called untitled. And um, I, I don't know, it's just a, a strange sort of thing. But my question kind of is how, um, as a reporter, and particularly as a wire service reporter, um, how does that influence or how does that impact your writing um, fiction, either long or short? Um, yeah, great question. And I will say this, this title thing is, um, I've heard that again and again. I think people are kind of of two minds um, that the, uh, I've, def I've definitely heard this before. And uh, for me, I, I, I think I was the same way for a while. And I finally decided just like, you know, you just got to push on or, or nothing's going to happen here. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, the way journalism um, uh, affects my fiction writing, you know, a couple things. First of all, the discipline of being a reporter. I mean, I've been a, I've been a, um, uh, I've been a reporter now for 33 years. And there's the first thing is just the discipline of the deadline um, has helped me enormously uh, in terms of just um, the importance of, of getting things done and, and working through the writing, even if I'm, I'm not completely up to it. Uh, but also, you know, without question, um, I am very lucky as a reporter um, to sort of get a um, in-person education for me in the criminal justice realm that I never would have been able to get otherwise. And I've taken advantage of that um, hopefully by bringing some authority to my writing, but also um, in a more prosaic way, just stealing from my own headlines. So I certainly um, uh, have incorporated um, a number of uh, stories that I've covered as a reporter in my fiction. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily lifting the facts completely in there, but certainly from an inspiration point of view, uh, I've done this multiple times. Uh, and in fact, my most recent novel called An Empty Grave is based, um, at least for starters, somewhat loosely on a, on a real cold case that I covered as an AP reporter, which involved a, um, a shootout between a Columbus police officer and a burglar in 1972. Both men were wounded. Um, the burglar ended up in the hospital. And then for reasons that are still kind of unclear, he basically sort of disappeared, walked out of a hospital, left the state, was never prosecuted. And then he was found living in, um, in Dayton 40 years later by the family of the police officer. And this uh, court, this court battle uh, ensued. Um, uh, and unfortunately for the family, the um, ultimately the, the man was not prosecuted. So that's an example of uh, one of many examples of how I've taken um, stuff that I've covered and, and incorporated them into my fiction. Now, I also, like everybody else, I, I mean, I'm a reporter, but I also just, I read the newspaper and read online and listen to the news. And I, there are things that I come across just as a regular person that I also include in my fiction. I got another quick question here. and I, I'm going to have to go right after this, but the um, I found, um, particularly from writing, um, well, no, not just at AP or, or UPI, but even when I worked for newspapers that I could write pretty much 
anywhere. I'm not as good at this as I used to be. Most, most authors that I hear about say, you know, you have to go to a room, you have to go to one specific place, you know, and, and that's where you should write. But I found because of, because, you know, as a, certainly as a wire service reporter, there's always a distraction. There's always a television on somewhere, or there's, there's always a, um, <clears throat> Um, this uh, police scanner on, there's something, some sort of distraction, and yet you still have to produce your copy. And so um, I, I found that, you know, as a result, I generally write alone by myself at my desk, you know, in, the, in, in whatever, but I can write pretty much anywhere. How is that for you? Do you, do you, you know, do you find that you can write anywhere or do you always pretty much sit at your kitchen table or wherever you'd normally write? Yeah, good question. So I think part of that is what I was talking about before the the discipline of being a reporter that you know the the key thing is you've got to produce a product on deadline. And I guess it wouldn't matter where you are. You know, that said, um, you know, I I have a very um uh I'm a very big on my routine. I have a home office. Uh, that's where I do uh, all of my fiction, uh, almost all of my fiction writing, unless I happen to be traveling someplace. Uh, and then, you know, I might sit in a hotel room if I'm working. Uh, but I'm an early bird. So I'm always up quite early. And I do I do all my personal writing at my um, in my home office with my now 17 year old cat uh, beside me. And that's, again, that's what works for me. Um, I, I would find it distracting to sort of move around or, you know, write in a coffee shop one day and write someplace else another day. I'm, I'm pretty big on routines. Uh, but again, this gets back to systems. Um, do what works for you. And if, if the ability to, if the key is that you're just writing, go with it. Thank you. Andrew, this is Janice, and I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, you know, I, I lived in Columbus before you were born. So I'm, you mentioned that you had covered an unsolved um, case from 1972. That was the year I left Columbus. So I was wondering if you could just tell me just a little bit about what that case was. And I'm also curious to know how you came up with the name Andy Hayes. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, on that cold case I mentioned, this involves a, a police officer named um, Nikki or Nick, Nikki Cooper. Uh, this happened in 1972. There were a series of burglaries on the east side of Columbus and the police department created a, a swing, a special, um, they call it D squad that worked like swing shift hours from like four in the afternoon to um, two in the morning or something, something like that. And um, this confrontation happened when Cooper, who was part of the D squad, uh, came across this burglar whose name was Charles Hayes. And um, they exchanged they exchanged gunfire. Uh, so the burglar, so the this ended the series of burglaries, but it also, in some ways, it ended Cooper's career as a police officer, even though he survived. Um, and uh, the uh, the conclusion of that case happened in late 2016 when uh, Cooper by now had passed away, but his adult children discovered Hayes was living in Dayton. So that's the, that's the case we're talking about. Um, yeah, so the name of Andy Hayes, um, this is a topic of, of great conversation. Uh, I'm often asked this question. And so first of all, I do not recommend that you name a character after yourself. Uh, however, in my defense, um, when I was mulling the creation of this private eye in this series, that name just came to me in a flash, and I knew I knew that was the person's name. Um, the, you know, Andy is sort of my alter ego to a degree. I know you're all going to find this hard to believe, but I actually was not a star quarterback at a Big Ten university. Um, however, I do, I, Andy and I, you know, we share some of the same sense of humor. We read some of the books, same books. But as I like to say, nobody ever calls me uh, Andy and nobody ever calls him Andrew. Now, the last name Hayes was a nod to, um, of course, the great Ohio State football coach, Woody Hayes. And fictionally in the books, when Andy, um, 
when my character was a, a rising high school uh, and then college star, people, of course, nicknamed him Woody, kind of in, in, uh, in reference to the actual Woody Hayes. Uh, so that's how his name came about. He actually, um, in the, it, by the time the books take place, all that's in the past, and he's always trying to distance himself from a lot of his uh, bad boy behavior as a, as a football player. So um, generally speaking, he won't let anybody call him Woody anymore, uh, with a, a couple of exceptions. That's, that's kind of what I thought, because back in the day, I worked at Ohio State, so I was familiar with who Woody Hayes was. And uh, just as a just to, to add, probably not that interesting, but I got my my the name of my main character in my cozies, Crystal Cropper. She was actually that is the name of a woman I worked with at the Columbus Dispatch back in you know the late sixties. So, not that interesting, but <laughs> um, anybody else. Steve? No? Uh, Janice, I have a question. Yes, Lily. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, I'd like to know if you're, okay, you, you work with the police, on the police beat, so you're familiar with cases. If you want to research a case that's not uh, that um, prominent in the, in the newspapers and all, where do you go to find cases like that? Yeah, great question. So um, for, sort of to, to work backwards, um, obviously um, newspaper archives are always a good place to start. And um, thankfully um, the internet has brought us good and bad things, but one amazing thing um, is that it's depending on <laughs> where you live and um, how this works, you can find newspaper archives going back for every newspaper for a long time. I mean, the Columbus Metropolitan Library um, provides me full access to every article that's ever appeared in the Columbus Dispatch uh, for free. So that's a tremendous help. Um, beyond that, um, I, like everybody else, I tend to use public records a lot. So Ohio actually has a pretty good public records law. I'm not, I'm not overly familiar with Indiana's, but it's relatively easy in Ohio to um, get a hold of public records. A lot of, a lot of even older public records now are online. Uh, and um, if they're not online, you can make a public records request to a police agency um, for an older file. Um, we had a very important Supreme Court ruling in Ohio in the past couple of years that said that um, uh, criminal cases uh, could be made public um, even if um, the um, prosecutors have been trying to close these cases if the uh, defendant was still alive, even if they were imprisoned, uh, and that, that would have been just disastrous. So um, it's now possible to get criminal records of, of all kinds. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I, I will occasionally call people who might have been involved in a particular case. I mean, I'm working on a true crime book now, and, um, you know, in addition to public records, I'm trying to just call and reach regular people and um, who were involved in the case. And, you know, calling somebody up, telling them you're a writer and they're working on a book or a story, you'd be amazed how many people would be like, okay, <laughs> what do you need to know? So I always recommend that as a source. Um, so I would say, you know, media accounts, uh, public records, and then, um, you know, um, obviously, maybe historical records in a historical society or the library, and then um, figures involved in the crime itself. Um, Janice, can I jump in here? Hello. Can you hear me okay, yes, Andrew? I'm, yes. Go, oh. Jump in, Steve. Sorry. Well, th th three points. Uh, one is I'm not a, as much up on... Indiana's public uh, records laws, public meeting laws, as I once was. And there have been court decisions that have, at one point in time, we had a fairly strong law, uh, but uh, courts have whittled and whittled and whittled at the law. We, as you know, are firmly a Republican state now and have been electing firmly 
appointing were firmly Republican judges. And, and uh, the records all as a shadow of what it was. Janet would know much more about that, but I don't see her on. She must have had to leave. Second, I was a journalist before I went to law school. I, uh, you mentioned deadlines and all that. I found out that lawyers have extent can get extensions of time, and it's it's a wonderful thing. And and so I decided I need to be a lawyer instead of a journalist. Yeah, I saw. Um, I the the last point was mentioning uh, discussing names. Uh, I came across a name the other day. I'm calling dibs on it, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. I swear to God. This was a guy who was quoted in a in a uh, uh, in a sports story, and he was some. I think he's some executive with with uh, either baseball or, or the NFL. His name is Guy Oder, and I just thought that man. I don't know who his parents were, but they should be lined up and shot. And, and somehow there's got to be a great story with some guy named Guy Over. Yeah, you need to you need to go with that. Um, that raises one other thing I, I will just mention, um, a topic of endless fascination to me. And I love hearing other people talk about this. But, you know, where do we come up with our characters names? And um, I used to use all kinds of methods. And then um, a few years ago, I acquired a 2008 Columbus White Pages. You may remember those. And um, I, I now take all my names uh, from that. So um, it's very common for me when I'm looking for a name, I will flip to one page, uh, find a last name, flip to another page, find a first name. And um, it just, it works wonders for me. Um, occasionally, I will end up... Um, actually accidentally using the name of a real person without meaning to. Um, and people will, will write and say, why did you make my uncle a murderer? And I'll have to assure them that it was a, a coincidence. But anyway, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, um, if you can find a white pages, they're just a great resource for, um, for uh, name creating, which sometimes can be a chore. Hey Janice, Tom Colmar here. I've got a, uh, uh, I guess, it, kind of a sort of a question that I wanna lay on Andrew. Go ahead. Andrew, I lived in Bloomington 69 through 74, went to school there, and I taught school out near Ellettsville for a year before I came to Indianapolis and got into business I'm in. Um, but I noticed a trend from the time I arrived in Bloomington all the way up into um, maybe recently, that it seems like every five years or so, a girl goes missing or gets killed down there. And it led me to believe that maybe there's a serial killer or killers that live in Bloomington. And I was actually gonna write a story about it, but I thought I'd get my ass sued off. So I thought I'd just better back off of that theory. But I ran into, I'm, I'm the president of the Milan Museum. And I ran into two former schoolmates of mine. One who was uh, the younger brother was um, chief of police down here in Bloomington. And his uh, sister was on the top of narcotics. And I laid my theory on them and the blood drained out of their faces and said, we need to talk. What do you think about that? Um, well, I certainly am familiar with a lot of those cases you're talking about. Um, I, uh, there was a lot of suspicion uh, and concern about the possibility of a serial killer when, when I was there in the 90s. Um, and I would, I would say two things. Um, there, uh, we, there's a, a serial killer is always a good hook for a novel. Um, I would be skeptical personally that there's a serial killer that's been operating in Bloomington for that long a period of time. Um, unfortunately, um, this is like a topic for a whole other Zoom conversation, but um, you know, in real life, uh, women are the victims of uh, violent crime frequently and way too often. And uh, I think that's part of what's going on. They're just, uh, uh, women are just the victims of, of uh, horrible crimes perpetrated by violent men. Um, so I'm not totally sure that's the same thing as there being a serial killer on the loose in Bloomington. Um, but that said, a novel, a novel about a serial killer um, on the loose in a college town like that would probably be pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Anyone else? 
Anyone else? Okay, I think I think we have given everybody an opportunity. So um, did you have anything you wanted to say, Andrew, to wrap up? Yeah, let me just, um, uh, let me drop my, okay, so I just, uh, I just dropped my email um, into the chat. And um, the only thing I would like to say, first of all, is thank you so much for this opportunity. It's I, just so great to, to be with you. You know, I recognize uh, a number of faces from uh, the late great uh, Magna Cum Murder uh, Conference. Um, and I was also pleased, thanks to Janice, to find out that it's sort of been reborn. Um, what's it called? Uh, prime, prime Crime at the Columbia. Yeah, so um, I'm hoping maybe even this coming spring to make that. Um, but I dropped my email in there. Please feel free to stay in touch, um, you know, uh, by email. You can check out my website, which is just standardwelshhoggins.com. Um, I'm on Facebook and uh, Instagram, where I tend mainly to post pictures of books I've read. Uh, but I'm happy to be a resource if, if I'm able to do that. Um, so once again, um, thank you so much. Really great being with you. Oh, well, thank you. And, and thank you for that, for your kind offer. And um, it truly great to see you again. So I wish you a wonderful weekend. And have, especially have a great time tonight with Second City. So all right, well, keep in touch. Same. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.